This morning's passage is from 1 Peter. We're going to be in chapter 2, and we're going to look at the first 12 verses. Let me read that for you. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as spiritual houses to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Behold, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passage of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Joel, come join us. Joel Hegel will be bringing the message this morning. You met him briefly. Joel and Liz live in Guadalajara, Mexico, where Joel is a professor, tenured professor, at um, university there. He also is the chair of the Biomechatronics Research Laboratory. Did I get that even close to being right? Okay, outstanding. I was like a philosophy major, so those words are, you know, make no sense to me. Uh, You also co-founded a Mexican nonprofit or NGO, and that helps provide uh, affordable prosthetics to people who are in need. And as I understand it, your whole ministry is based on using engineering as a way of ministering to people in developing countries and equipping right. others to do the same. So that's great. Um, Joel, I look forward to hearing from you this morning. Let me pray. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we are blessed to have Joel here. But Lord, we also recognize first and foremost, we are blessed to have your word and to have you call us here together to hear your word and to respond to your word. Lord, open our hearts that we may receive it well. And Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit would guide Joel as he speaks, that this would be not coming from him, but it would be clear that it's coming from you. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Joel. Privileged to be here this morning. I have two disclaimers before I get started. One disclaimer is that I'm finally paying a debt that I owed to Pastor Jim Johnson. For it was many years ago that I took a course called Timothy Training here at Fellowship Bible Church, and it prepared me in a way that I don't think any other course had prepared me for being able to preach and teach uh, the little bit that I do do uh, as a university professor. Uh, But Timothy Training was to prepare those of us in the body to share in preaching and teaching And I don't think I've ever preached at Fellowship Bible Church since. So I uh, am finally paying that debt that I owe. That's one disclaimer. The other disclaimer is you may have heard the name Hegel before and not associated it with me. Uh, I do have a brother whose name is Daniel. um, And his son Andre is here. He's at Letourneau right now studying. And Daniel has been a member of Fellowship Bible Church as long as I have, just a week longer. 
but since we left Laterno, he and I have never been at fellowship on the same day. So you may have confused us through the years that there's uh, only one Hegel and there's actually two, and actually there's four siblings in the family. But anyway, that's my other disclaimer. Uh, I joined FBC in 1988 when I came to Longview to go to Laterno University. And after graduation, I served as an FBC short-term missionary for two years in San Luis Potosí. And then I went on to get my master's degree at the University of Washington, came back to Longview uh, to work at General Dynamics, and I, few, I see a few people from that time here, uh, and was a member of FBC again for, for several years. And then I received an invitation to go to the country of Nepal between China and India in the Himalaya Mountains, where I had opportunity to teach engineering on a university campus. And I saw, and that's where I became passionate about using higher education as a way to ministry in limited, closed, and other parts of the world, but specifically on university campuses. And so since then, I have been teaching engineering um, in Mexico uh, at a university there and using that as my tent-making path into ministry on campus and in the community. When the missions committee asked me to speak today, um, they asked me to connect glory and the mission. And uh, immediately I thought about 1 Peter chapter 2 and decided that's the passage I wanted to use. Uh, it's not the typical missions Matthew 28 passage for talking about missions, but I think you'll see from the sermon today that I have titled Proclaim him who called you out of shameful darkness into his glorious light. Or another title that I was tempted to use is Out of Glorious Darkness into Shameful Light. Wait a minute, Joel. Glorious Darkness and Shameful Light? Yes. Uh, that's what I meant to say because... I would say, you've heard this, the saying, not all that glitters is gold. I would say, not all that glitters is glory gold, and not all that rusts is shameful. And that's what I want to talk about today. We exchange worldly glory for shame here on earth, shame that becomes the glorification of God. Winter Olympics 1988, Calgary, Canada, against all odds, the country of Jamaica had sent a team to compete in the bobsled race. You've probably seen the movie or heard of it. Uh, so the team receives an ovation at, as the crowd sees them set up for the, take, for the takeoff. And they're being cheered. Why? Because they are overcoming great odds to be competing that day. They are the first team from a tropical country to compete in the Winter Games. Halfway down the toboggan, they wipe out. And they don't even finish the race. But they go home as heroes and receive glory in Canada and in Jamaica and the rest of the world for being triumphant over a challenge. We easily associate the term glory with sporting events, don't we? Uh, where someone wins or even just competes against great odds. The Bahaman team uh, was clothed in glory due to the challenge that they faced. Or widely recognized as one of the best players in baseball, Alex Ro Rodriguez, A-Rod, holds the record for the largest contract in baseball history. I can remember in Seattle watching him step up to the plate and hit another home run and cheering with the crowd. Uh, Throughout his career, Rodriguez continually denied accusations of having used performance-enhancing drugs. But in 2009, under legal pressure, he finally admitted that from 2001 to 2003, in fact, he had been using performance-enhancement drugs. And his glory of his career turned to shame. Shame is a profound antonym opposite for glory. But neither shame nor glory is necessarily synonymous to winning or losing. Neither concept is a synonym 
to believing or doubting, neither to boldly preaching or quietly serving, neither to succeeding or failing, not even either of those, neither of those, neither of those, uh, to living or dying. More easily said, not all that glitters is glory, and not all that rusts is shame. Let me explain. Shame is the painful emotion and the social shunning caused by a consciousness that may be real or perceived about one of three types of events. It could be guilt, shortcoming, or impropriety. Shame can be imposed on ourselves by ourselves. Shame can be imposed on us by others. Shame can even be imposed on us by the Spirit of God. Let's take a look at those three examples. Uh, first of all, shame caused by guilt. He was a very powerful man at the height of his career, and yet he abused his power to sleep with another man's woman, with another man's wife. She became pregnant. He tried to cover up this involvement, but it resulted in murder. But upon the possibility of an expose in Facebook and online, he felt the pain and shame of the shame caused by guilt. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame, the Bible says. Second, take the shame caused by a shortcoming. Let's say in the Olympics, there's a woman racing in the 500-meter race at home in her, home in her small country. She outperformed everybody. But now at the Olympic race, in the last lap, she's a lap away from the rest of the runners. She keeps on running. She finishes the race in view of all the stadium. There's no guilt here, but certainly there can be great shame for the shortcoming that she's had in that moment. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Or take the third cause of impropriety. Rebecca was suffering from an illness that left her unclean, uncomfortable, and uncomforted. She knew that Jesus could heal her, but she couldn't bring herself to kneel before Jesus as the leper or as the blind. She had no shortcoming. She had no guilt. But still she lived in a personal and public shame caused by the impropriety of her condition. Just a social stigma, impropriety that, that made her feel outcast and ashamed. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Because sin is alive in our bodies, Romans 7.23, because we are beset with weaknesses, Hebrews 5.2, the kind of shame we often experience is a potent combination of failure and pride. We fail morally. That's our guilt. We fail due to our limitations. That's our shortcomings. As missionaries, that happens a lot. We fail because all creation is subject to the futility that doesn't work as it should. Romans 8.20. We also fail to live up to other people's expectations. And because we are full of sinful pride, we are ashamed of our guilt, failures, and weaknesses. We'll go at almost any length to cover up this shame from others. This means pride fuels shame can wield great emotional power over us. It controls significant parts of our lives. It consumes precious energy and time in avoiding exposure. What's interesting, though, is that shame can also be a powerful driving force taking sinners to the foot of the cross and to believe and accept Jesus as Lord. Now a familiar missions passage, Romans 10, 9 and 10. You probably know it by heart, some of you. 
I think it's an Awana verse. I'm sure it is, because that's when I learned it. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with the heart that one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. But do you know verse 11? The apostle goes on. For scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Paul could have used many other topics related to our salvation, but in this passage, he selects shame. Shame is the motivator for belief and confession, at least in this passage, and I would argue in other passages. Shame is also a powerful restraint, keeping us from doing something that, that could cause shame. Some shame is healthy for us then, and some shame is poisonous. But which is which? Not all that rusts is shameful. I think 1 Corinthians 1.27 starts sending us in the right direction. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. The key to differentiate between healthy shame and poisonous shame is to identify the role that God plays in each case. It's not black and white from the perspective of the situation. Whether our shame gives glory to God or our shame dishonors God makes all the difference. If we want to battle shame at the root, we have to know how it relates to God, and we need to do battle with shame at the root, all shame. Because both poisonous shame and healthy shame can cripple us if we don't know how to deal with each at the root. Healthy shame can empower us tremendously. Take that powerful yet guilty man, King David, right? His shame kept him humble. Kept him humble as a humble servant of God the rest of his life. The shame and impropriety of Rebecca's condition demonstrated God's power and therefore the glory of God. When a Christian's eyes are opened to the God-dishonoring evil of our past, the Christian is rightly guilty and feels ashamed. Paul says to the Roman church in chapter 6, 20 and 21, when you were slaves to sin, what fruit were you getting at that time from the things which you are now ashamed of? Powerful driving force. Well-placed shame can be very healthy and redemptive. Paul said to the Thessalonians, if anyone does not obey, have nothing to do with him that he, he may be ashamed. This means that shame is a proper and redemptive step in conversion and even in a believer's repentance for shortcomings in a season of spiritual coldness and sin. Shame is not something to be avoided at all costs. There's a place for it in God's good work with his people. We can conclude then that the biblical criterion for poisonous shame and for healthy shame is radically God-centered. And it's definitely not human-centered. Poisonous shame says, don't feel shame for something that honors God, no matter how weak or foolish or wrong it makes you look in the eyes of other people. The biblical criterion for healthy shame says, do feel shame for having a hand at anything that dishonors God, no matter how strong or wise or right it may make, might make you look in the eyes of others. The world may give you glory, but God will shame you. So during the times that you're in shame, shortcomings, impropriety, or even guilt, God gives us seven things when he visits us in the midst of our shameful trial. He gives us truth that we might remain faithful. The Spirit will give you the assurance you need so that you won't doubt. 
He gives glory to Jesus Christ, who's the center of all truth. He will give his presence even in the final hour of testing. He will give you the love of Christ even in the depths of that degenerative disease. As the Spirit of God rests on each of us, each of you, he will give you a taste of the eternal glory that you are about to receive. The earthly glory we are losing in this shame-filled moment is not worth keeping, and the glory we are about to gain is infinitely better and worthy of everything. Hebrews 12.2 says, Jesus, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God, at the right hand of the throne of God, at the glory of God. Verse 12 in our text says, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. The supreme goal in God of God in history, in human history, and universal history, from the beginning to the end, is the manifestation of his glory. Accordingly, our duty and privilege is to bring our thoughts, affections, actions in line with this goal. It should become our supreme goal to glorify God. The way we glorify God is first to delight in his glory more than anything else, to be grateful for his glory. Then, as a natural result of this glory in God, we experience freedom from selfishness and freedom from our shame. We are moved to seek the good of others without personal gain. Thus, love becomes the chief means by which we join God in the open display of his glory and accomplish his goal in history. In contrast to human glory that we can, in some sense, earn, buy, or fabricate, we don't actually add to God's glory, but we can make God look more glorious here on earth. We can certainly glorify God by opening glimpses into his holiness. Peter says that they may see your good deeds and glorify God, that the Gentiles may see your good deeds and glorify God. Well, first, what is glory? I believe God's glory is that which we can perceive, that which we can perceive from an infinitely holy God. The holiness of God is infinite, the infinite value of God, the infinite intrinsic worth of God. And when we see the holiness of God in creation, the heavens are telling the glory of God and human beings are manifesting his glory because God wired us, along with creation, to display his glory. I would say we have three primary definitions to the term glory when it relates to God. God's intrinsic glory caused by him being set apart, this holiness. Uh, these attributes ascribe glory to God in a way no other can receive glory. Isaiah 42, 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name, I give glory to no other. The glory of God is evidenced in creation, the universe and all that's in it, including humanity. Psalm 8, 3 and 5 says, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. And believers glorify God by the good works that they perform. Revelation 19.1 says, I heard, after this, I heard what seemed to be a loud voice and a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah, salvation and glory belong to our God. Now you might mistakenly um, imagine the relationship between God's holiness and his glory and the world in this way. I would say you might imagine God's holiness as this cosmic light bulb that's somehow 
cloaked and covered up. Now, the light bulb is turned on and it's shining, but somehow we don't see that holiness. We don't see that glory. And, and so maybe if we rip that garment or we can peek through that garment, that's how we can see God's glory that's in this cosmic light bulb. But I think that that way to talk about God's glory is kind of myopic, or I would even say microscopic. Microscopic because uh, a microscope amplifies something that's very, very small so that we can actually see it. And that's kind of the way I see that interpretation of what God's glory might be. God's glory is not small, it's very, very large. In his vision, the prophet Isaiah heard the seraphim announce, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled of his... Wait a minute, but why didn't they just say holy again? If they said holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, it should have been his holiness. But they say glory. They're ascribing the holiness, they're ascribing holiness to the God Almighty. But when holiness, so to speak, goes public, becomes evident or perceivable by us humans, then it becomes glory. To humanity, that's what the Bible calls God's glory. I believe a better picture then of God's holy would be, holiness would be something like this, and glory and the relationship to the earth. Imagine a thousand stars. And each one of those stars is part of God's holiness. And a thousand still isn't enough. We need an infinite number because the Bible says his holiness is infinite. But imagine that we had all these stars and they're all around us and we're the ones that are in a glass fishbowl cloaked in a garment of darkness of sin and shame and even wrapped up in darkness and sin and shame. And so the glory of God is when we manage to rip through that garment of sin and shame and we can see one, two, or thousands of these holinesses of God. When the, when the light of all of that holiness of God penetrates our little fishbowl. The light pouring in then is the glory of God. Just as a little side note, I'd say uh, the term glory in Hebrew, what we've been talking about is kind of the figurative definition, but the, def the root word for glory was kavod. And kavod means heavy, solid, or firm. And I've meditated over the years on this. If God's glory is heavy and solid, then it's not just this light that comes in. It would be more like saying that God's glory is something more solid, more real, more heavy than even what we are. And so as it streams into the darkened and cloaked bowl that we're in, rather than it just being light, it's all this solid substance that's coming in as well. Um, and we perceive it with our imperfect senses, our sight, our hearing, our heart. Just take an x-ray image of your hand or your foot and you know that you aren't very solid, are you? Uh, we're not very solid at all compared to something like lead, compared to something like God's glory. We can only see a dim image of the real. Our eyes can only perceive 1% of the light spectrum. In a sense, when God's glory is revealed, that is because our wimpy X-ray eyes have caught a glimpse of the more solid, the more real. And that is just regarding the part of God's glory that we can see visually, but there's other ways to see God's glory. For one of those thousands of holinesses of God that can be revealed. So God's glory is the revealing of his holiness, the radiance of his holiness, infinitely worthy, beautiful, grand, valuable holiness. John Piper says, Glory is, revealing, is the revealing of the holy in the midst of the profane. Or we could say that his glory shows God's special presence in the universe and in human life. Preparing this sermon, I've now finally seen a connection, a better connection in the phrase of our passage, that they may see your good deeds and glorify God. 
Thus, our mission is to make God's glory shine. We want to make his glory perceivable to humanity. God invites each of us to make small rips in that cloak of darkness so that God's glory can shine into human existence. How do we do that? Peter tells us in the passage in verse 12, and he's actually quoting Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, when he says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So the goal of my life should be to so live that when people know me well enough, they would say, God is glorious. Not Joel is glorious, but God is glorious. 19 years ago, I had just returned from Nepal, and I was looking for a university position, a faculty position somewhere in the world, uh, to serve as an academic tent-making missionary. And I applied at the Tec de Monterrey in Guadalajara. Uh, and I'd already been through several battery of tests. Uh, I'd interviewed with several of the leaders. And I just had one interview left with the president of the university. And so the morning of the interview, I was reading my Bible, reading the, doing my devotional, and I came to Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, that is this passage. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I felt the Lord telling me, this passage is going to be important today. Make sure you can say it, memorize it. So I went into the interview, and the president caught me off guard when he stated, I'm not going to ask you about your academic credentials. That's already been checked out by the department. I'm not going to ask you about your teaching philosophy. Uh, I want to know if you're going to connect with our university family. So tell me about your family. So I said, well, uh, my parents are missionaries. They've been missionaries here in Mexico for over 30 years. My oldest brother is a pastor in Texas. My next brother is a missionary in Malaysia at the time. My sister is a missionary in Chile. He said, oh, uh, it seems to me from what you say that your evangelical belief is fairly important to you and your family. I said, yes, it is. He said, uh, do you know that our, uni that our university is expressly non-religious and non-political? That means that no faculty can express religious positions on campus and no faculty can express political positions on campus. Even students aren't allowed to do either one in some, some sense. I said, uh, yeah, I know that. He said, then tell me, uh, how are you going to live and work on our university campus where your religion expects you to be proselytizing others to your faith and basically evangelizing. And that's when I, the Spirit brought back to mind this passage, and I said, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells his disciples that they should let their light shine before others so that their good works can be seen and they can glorify their Father in heaven. I said, in my work here at the university, I will conduct myself with utmost integrity, and I will care for my students. I will look out for their well-being. And I'll, I'll genuinely care for them. Uh, in this way, they will glorify God. I said, I don't know exactly how that exchange works uh, between my good works and them glorifying God. Uh, but I'll leave that. I'll trust that to God. Uh, I'll honor that non-proselytizing policy that the university has. But when a student asks me the reason why I'm different than the typical uncaring, uh, mean professor, university professor, that'll be my opportunity to say the reason for my faith and the reason for the way I behave. The president smiled in surprise, and he said, I had never heard this dilemma expressed or resolved in this way. I find your position most interesting and quite acceptable. Uh, just know that if I ever get a, co a complaint about you proselytizing on campus, uh, that'll be reason for termination. Uh, I said, okay, I agreed with that, and I'm still at the university 20 years later, um, and that pr president is long gone. <laughs> uh, 
Again, the glory of God exists to magnify the truth and worth and beauty and greatness of God's holiness. Not the way a mi microscope magnifies, but more like the way a telescope magnifies. Telescopes magnify by making unimaginably large things that are occluded by distance seem more like what they really are, massively big things. And so in the same way, the glory of God magnifies by making God's magnificent holiness that's occluded by our sin look more like what it really is, massively magnificent holiness. Here's the tie. How do we glorify God? How do we make rips in the shameful garment of sinful human existence so that God's holiness can be revealed? We glorify him by walking through the valleys of the shadow of death, by walking through the trials that we're in, by walking through the temptations of life, joyful and unashamed. Not just overcoming the trials, I think even Gentiles do that, but also by coming through the trials with glory, with joy, and unashamed. These are the good works that glorify God. As Paul stated in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overcome you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. So, but when you are tempted... He will also provide a way out so you can stand up under it. We glorify God by enduring our trials and challenges, challenges caused by our own shameful guilt, our own shameful shortcomings, and our own impropriety. We still glorify God while being shamed by the world and its trials regardless of the origin of that shame, whether it's ourselves, whether it's others, whether that shame is being brought on by the forces of evil around us in the world, here in Longview, Texas, or any other part of the world. Even the shame brought on by our glorious God, like Job received. In all of our shameful trials, we still can glorify God. And then as a final, how should we be sharing the gospel in the 21st century? And I think you heard all the different ways this morning that we can glorify God from technology to ministry to helping others to empowering to mentoring. And I'm hearing more and more mentoring globally from wherever we are. Or should we continue with the street evangelism and revivals that worked so well a century ago? I don't know. 1 Peter 2.9 states, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness, the darkness of our shame, into the marvelous light, the light of his glory. Declare, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples, says Psalm 96. We proclaim his glory when we succeed unexpectedly in the face of a trial. We proclaim his glory when we fail, but continue on. We proclaim his glory when we sin and humbly repent. We proclaim his glory when we believe like a mustard seed. We proclaim his glory when we doubt, but wait for the presence of God. We proclaim his glory when we boldly preach to the nations, and we proclaim his glory when we silently serve the outcast, the poor, and the slave. We proclaim his glory when we, when we live for him. 
and we proclaim his glory when we confront life's final trial of death with joy. We proclaim his glory when each of us conduct the work that he's called us to, be it here in Longview, here in Texas, the United States, or somewhere else in the world. My wife Liz and I currently proclaim his glory on a university campus where once in a while I've identified that there's one or two other Christian professors. Uh, some of you might know Craig Wanamendi here at, at Fellowship, teaches at Laterno. He served two years, I believe, two years at the university where I teach. Uh, we proclaim his glory teaching engineering at a secular, secular university. We proclaim his glory with a little nonprofit we started that's allowed us to bring together over, uh, over about $100,000 to provide low-cost prosthetics to people in need. Some of you may remember Roger Gonzalez. Uh, he and I collaborate on this project and uh, place the knee that was developed here at Laterno um, as one of the tools, one of the components that we use in our prosthetics work. And so we proclaim God's glory to the poor, the disabled, through our nonprofit. How do you proclaim God's glory? Even through the shameful trials, guilt, shortcomings, and even improprieties and things you had no control over, we proclaim his glory. I'll just share this short video as a way to close the way we're serving uh, there in Mexico with our nonprofit. Thank you very much. Tecnologías para la comunidad eh, tiene el objetivo de recuperar la autonomía de personas que han sufrido una amputación de pierna, ofreciéndoles eh, servicios eh, protésicos y de rehabilitación física previa y posterior a recibir la prótesis. Estamos hablando de más de un millón de personas en México tienen la necesidad de una prótesis de miembro interior. Eh, de esas personas, eh, normalmente solamente un 10%, un 20% tienen acceso a una prótesis y de ellos solamente el 5% realmente logran utilizar su prótesis. Entonces había una gran necesidad, nosotros estábamos desarrollando la tecnología y quisimos entonces hacer un emprendimiento. Y junto con mis alumnos de Mecatrónica, invitamos a algunos alumnos de, de creación de empresas a que se unieran con nosotros. Y al hacer el estudio del mercado, determinamos que primero debíamos de empezar una asociación civil. Y es como fundamos Tecnologías al Servicio de la Comunidad en el 2014. El mayor valor es que no solamente entregamos una prótesis, sino integramos todos los servicios que una persona con una amputación necesita. Eh, estamos eh, haciendo este acompañamiento integral, le llamamos, para que la persona pueda eh, recuperar en un mayor nivel su, su autonomía. Sí, pues el impacto es que una prótesis eh, comercial puede estar costando 50, 100 mil pesos. Eh, nosotros hemos encontrado algunas tecnologías como esta que están disponibles en el mercado internacional. Las hemos podido traer. No tienen la, la parte cosmética, que a lo mejor quisiera uno tener, o la parte muy funcional de las prótesis de alto rendimiento, pero es una prótesis, como quien dice, eh, producto de entrada al mercado, donde un, una persona que tiene la necesidad puede utilizar una prótesis por un periodo de tiempo, recuperar su autonomía, volver a trabajar y ahora sí cambiar a una prótesis de mayor, eh, de mayor funcionalidad y a lo mejor de mayor este, visibilidad. Entonces, eh, nosotros hemos podido cerrar la brecha entre los costos de las prótesis y lo que un beneficiado aquí en México realmente puede pagar para una prótesis. Yo creo que el mayor reto es eh, poder acercar o integrar todos los servicios que una persona con una amputación de pierna necesita. Yo creo que no solamente es entregarles una prótesis y ya, es la atención médica, la atención fisioterapéutica, la atención psicológica, eh, después viene la reinserción a la vida laboral una vez que les entregamos la prótesis 
Y yo creo que ese ha sido el mayor reto y también junto con encontrar precios accesibles, ya que aquí en México pues una prótesis, digamos, eh, económica tiene un precio alrededor de 30 mil pesos. Nosotros logramos integrar esos servicios, conseguir precios accesibles y dar una prótesis a la mitad de lo que realmente se está ofreciendo en el mercado. Y claro, detrás de nosotros venía todo el voluntariado desde el TEC de Monterrey, alumnos queriendo hacer su servicio social a, en un proyecto que tuviera una base tecnológica, alumnos de mecatrónica, de biomedicina, de electrónica. Eh, y entonces esos alumnos tienen la oportunidad de ver cómo esta tecnología está impactando las vidas de personas inmediatamente aquí en nuestra comunidad. Yo creo que uno de los retos fundamentales es el equipo de trabajo. Eh, tiene uno que buscar a las personas que tienen las habilidades, los conocimientos, eh, los contactos que a lo mejor yo en mi grupo no tengo. Y a veces como amigos queremos hacer el emprendimiento, pero tenemos que ir fuera de nuestra área de confort y buscar a gente que, que tiene otras capacidades para poder integrar un equipo de trabajo que sea funcional y que logre eh, lidiar con todo, con todo lo que está por delante. Thank you, Joel. Um, we're going to wrap up our service, and here's what we're going to do. Uh, I want to first remind you that you have an opportunity to connect with these missionaries uh, next door in the gym. We've got set up for food and tables where missionaries will be at the different tables. Please, even if you can't stay and eat, just wander over there and connect. If you are one of our missionaries, uh, you should be heading there now to get to your table. Um, so run, Joel, run. <laughs> um, so uh, we do want to let them have a, a running head start so they can get there and uh, get set up, and then we will join them. Um, I want to invite the prayer team to come forward. These folks are here to pray with you no matter what you need prayer about and uh, to support you and love you. So prayer team, could you please join us? And would you stand and let's close in prayer. Father, we are always amazed to hear how your glory is being manifest throughout the world. We see glimpses of it here. We see our own little pieces of your work And yet, Lord, when we open our eyes and see what you are doing throughout the world, it is amazing. And even what we have heard this weekend has been such a small, small part of your glory and your work that is being done throughout the world. Lord, in a world that sometimes feels like it's out of control, that um, it is chaotic, it is good to be reminded that this world is very, very small compared to your vastness and greatness. And you have never once relinquished your control. We thank you for that. May we live in light of that. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we leave, let me point out to you what Joel said about who God is. God's primary supreme goal is to manifest his holiness, his glory. And so the challenge to us is to enter into the foreign lands of our neighbor's lives so completely and so righteously that people will look at us and say, I want to know their God. You are dismissed with that assignment. Please come pray with us if you need to pray.